All right, Monica, let's start with welcome home. Thank you, Doug. It's always good to be home and always good to see you. Well, I grew up watching you, as you know. I, and I appreciate that. The year you started at HAS, what year was that? 1973. 1973. So you have never forgotten your Louisville roots, although you became and are still very well known and big in Atlanta. Um, you, you left Louisville after getting your your, your roots here are here, and do you remember this room where we're sitting, and do you remember this building, and, and why do you always like to give back to presentation? Presentation is responsible for my success, my mom and presentation. It's very simple. Uh, I got the best education you could get in this building. What I always say about Prez is that it takes young, young girls and turns them into significant women. Um, when I was here at Prez, no one ever told me what I couldn't do. It was always what I could do. You know, back then, think back to 1965. Well, actually, 1961 through 1965. A lot was going on. Um, and women were still in a, a different level, shall we say. I can remember Diane Sawyer being here in Louisville working as a weather girl because no one thought of her as being a reporter, even though she had the education and her father was a county judge. But the point was, women in television back th then, it was basically they wanted you to have hair down to here, chest out to here, and not much up here. It was basically you were window dressing. And the nice thing about that time period also is that Prez told young women, all you have to do is work for it. Get the education you need. There are no barriers except those you put for yourself. Now, some people may tell you you can't do it, but make a lie out of them and show them that you can. We had strong nuns in this building who dedicated their lives to making sure that we all were going to be successful and that we could hold our own with anybody, stand toe to toe with anybody. I can remember the debate classes. I can remember the writing classes. I can even remember the chorus and then <laughs> what you're gonna laugh when I tell you this, but I remember Miss Dunleavy, who was the gym instructor, who was just as get in there and get this done and come on, you know, hit that ball. She, <laughs> she believed in us, not being sweet little ladies all the time, but knowing when to be aggressive and knowing when to be that ladylike person. I love this school because it, you know, I hate to use the phrase that, that the Army uses, but you can be all you can be. So how did it fortify you for a pretty rough and tumble career? Uh oh. Journalism, first black woman to anchor in Louisville, and then first uh, black woman to be the main evening anchor in Atlanta. Uh, were there I could hear. No, I can still hear people in this school telling me, you know, you can do this get involved. That was the one thing that the school really taught me about the importance of community involvement because we always did volunteer work and my mother was very strong believer in that too. So when I went to Atlanta the first thing I did was to get a church which was St. Anthony's Catholic Church and then the second thing I did was to become involved in the YMCA, the Butler Street YMCA because I had been involved in the Y movement here so the lessons that I learned at Prez carried over to make things smoother for me in Atlanta because I, sh I formed a family there. You notice Prez girls are family. No matter where you go, if somebody found out you went to Presentation Academy, it's like, ah, my sister. It's almost a sorority. <laughs> well, 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 being a person who was first or a trailblazer, uh, how did you find yourself reflecting back to lessons from presentation when you felt when you were faced with either racism or roadblocks or people telling you no? Okay. So when I look back at, um, remember the lesson I told you about people here at Prez, we were all told we could be anything we wanted to be and were prepared to be. But they also told us, Miss Dunleavy, that you don't have to take a back seat to anybody and that you have to learn to stand your ground. 
So I can remember when I went on the air in Atlanta, there were people, black people, who said I didn't look black enough because I didn't have a fro and they felt I should be more. <clears throat> and then there were white people who didn't want me on the air either. And they would call and they would complain and they would say very nasty things. And I would hear my mother and I would hear Miss Dunleavy in the back of my head saying, you know, they don't shape who you are. You do. Ignore them and pray for them. That's all you can do. At a young age. You at were, a young age. You were fortifying through, pushing yes, through. Yes, pushing through. Um, because you have to remember, I was the first. And if I didn't do well, nobody else was going to be able to hold that job. And within two years in Atlanta, there was a woman, black and white, or white, on the 6 o'clock news within two years of my being on the air. So you, you open doors that way. If I had struck back, that's what Prez taught me to do, to use your mind and to control your emotions. You must be logical. There are times you show heart. There are times you show appropriate anger. And then there are times you literally just usa. <laughs> so your Louisville upbringing in Smoketown, I heard you do an interview one time where you said you were selling green stamps as a young, young girl. I worked for, around the corner, that's, you know, that's the problem with coming back to Louisville when you've, you've, you're my age and I'll be 76 this month. You see things that used to be there. Uh, around the corner from the school, there was S&H green stamps and top value stamps. And I worked at both of them at one time or another where I had to take the books that the women brought in and check the books and make sure they had the appropriate number of stamps so that they could get the items that they wanted. That taught me diplomacy. <laughs> because a lot of times people would fill in the front, the back, and not really fill in all the middle. <laughs> and you tell some woman who's come in with 100 books, hey lady, I'm sorry, but some of these books don't have all the stamps. I can't give you that toaster you wanted. You learn diplomacy. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I even at a young age, you had your toe in journalism. I did. What, I got my WLOU first stop. WLOU and some other places? I was really blessed. At the age of 16, I had two freebie volunteer jobs. One, I was in the Emancipation Proclamation pageant that the Louisville Defender had. And that was really great, to be exposed to newspaper. Uh, the Stanley family owned the newspaper back then, Frank Stanley. So I worked for Bill Summers at first black radio station owner in the state of Kentucky and I did voiceover work. And that was a joy. And for me, I look at that and then I look at the newspaper work I did here at Prez and then I look at the Louisville Defender and I was being shaped and moved in those directions because I really planned to be a teacher. I was so impressed by the education that I got here and the teachers that I had here that I was going to be a teacher. Man proposes, God disposes. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so you, you work into the newspaper business somehow before being discovered into television. Exactly. Tell me, tell me that route and how that worked. Uh, I worked, long story short, I dropped out of the University of Louisville to get married and got a job at the bank. Liberty. Liberty National Bank, across the street from the Courier Journal and Louisville Journal. Times. And I helped reporters so much that one day someone said, well, why don't you come over and help us at the newspaper? And so I applied for a job as a newsroom clerk. Got the job under, oh, I, you know, when I think about it, I'm gonna say names that people don't know, but John Hershenroder, who was the first country's ombudsman in the nation. And then uh, Norman Isaacs, the unbelievable executive editor of the paper. So I was there at the golden days. John Fetterman, who was an unbelievable reporter. Uh, mainly, I'm thinking of what's the Sinclair. They did these great stories on strip mining. Really excellent reporting. And I was a newsroom clerk doing obituaries. And then in 1968, after the riots, Columbia University and the Ford Foundation started the summer program for minority groups because they wanted more people of color in newsrooms. The second year, 1969, 
they had print and I was selected to go. And when I came back from New York, I went to work for Mary Phyllis Reedley in the newsroom. Uh, she was the women's editor. In Most the, people in the don't feature know. Section, yeah. Oh, it's called feature section now, but back then it was called the women's department. <laughs> So I worked there, wanted to go into television, applied for a job at WAVE, was told you don't look the part, you don't sound the part, and you don't write well for television. When I asked why didn't I get the job. So I went to Jean Hamilton School of Modeling and that led me to a part-time job to learn to do stand-ups, believe it or not, at Bix Department Store. And I would go from the department store to, and this was at Hurstbourne, or was it Oxmoor? It was Oxmoor. Oxmoor, to Oxmoor, and go into a restaurant, disturb people, telling them about my outfit. Best training I ever got for a stand-up. And one night, uh, June Dorsey was in there, and she said, what do you do when you aren't doing this? And I said, well, I'm a former newspaper reporter, now doing public relations at Brown Foreman. Realized this is not for me, because when they had a strike, I told both sides of the story, and Mr. Brown called me in and said, there's only one side, the company side. <laughs> and I knew then it was time to go back to something else. So she said, uh, can you come back? And I said, yeah. Her husband, Tom Dorsey, who at then was the news director of WHAS. And that's how I got my job at WHAS. He hired you as a reporter. He hired me as a reporter and then put me on as an anchor. And you, you are the first black woman to anchor in Louisville. I didn't know that because I knew Van Vance confirms that. To me. I didn't know that. Yes. So, so and, th and there you are. You, you were here for only a couple of years in your hometown. Why didn't you stay? Seventy-three to seventy-five. I worked at WHAS, but this opportunity became open in Atlanta, and it's WAVE's fault. Uh, the station that told me I would never make it. We were doing so well on weekends. They gave a copy of my tape to their consultant, Dick Mallory, who worked for Maggot. He was also a consultant for WSB TV in Atlanta. They were looking for an anchor and preferably a black woman for their six o'clock news. And so that's how I got to Atlanta, thanks to Wave. Now, you know what's funny about this even more? Guess who Wave is owned by now? <laughs> Gray. <laughs> <laughs> you're working for. <laughs> so, so you told me that you actually left WHAS for Atlanta for less money, that WHAS was going yes. to offer you more money to stay. WHAS did offer me more money to stay, but it was the opportunity to have a Monday through Friday anchoring job that made me leave. Because at that time in Louisville, my chances of getting on the six o'clock news were slim and none. And this was a big opportunity. So yes, I took a pay a cut because how could you not say yes to that opportunity? I didn't know what I was getting into. Uh, as I said, a lot of people were not happy that they brought this black woman in from Kentucky. When you had another woman, Jocelyn Dorsey, who was the first black anchor in Atlanta, they didn't put her in that position. But Jocelyn said to me, Monica, it was a case of, she was wearing a big fro, they didn't think the audience would accept it in the six o'clock news. And I say, it's because if I didn't do well, what did they lose? If you had taken that other anchor who had a really good following, put her into that position where she might have failed, it would not have been good. You would have lost two, you know, one good person. So the funny part about this story is there were three people who were up for the job. Jane Pauley, Oprah Winfrey, and me, and I got it. I often say, <laughs> beat out Oprah. where would I be? I beat out Jane Pauley and Oprah Winfrey for that job. You're, you're, it just seems to me, Monica, that uh, through the decades, you've, you've had to face things that would crush people mm -hmm. or bring them really down to depression be it racism or be it a lost job or be it a really tough situation working with people in, in a different newsroom. How did you power through that? Was it always posit positivity I, that you I played to tennis. Now, Doug, I'm going to be honest with you. I am human and things can bother you. I can remember one day touching my male anchor 
on set. And when I got off the set, receiving some of the vilest comments I've ever heard in phone messages. From viewers. Uh, from viewers saying, you don't know your place. And I'm like, what do you mean? Um, I always play tennis and I learned to play golf and I named the balls. <laughs> You have to get that out, but I would never let it show on the air or respond to people in a way that they can say, I gotcha, I knew that's how you really were. So you learn to control your emotions, but then for me, I learned to get them out by running. That's why my knees are bad. By playing tennis, that's why my knees are bad. Playing golf and walking before golf carts are really popular, that's why my knees are bad. But that's the way I, worked around it and then I was involved in my church and I did other things in the community. I did not make the job what defined me. And that's what happens with a lot of people. They think that job defines them. I'm more than an anchor and a reporter. And that kept me sane. Now that you come back to Louisville, um, why is Louisville special to you, uh, even though, even though uh, you left a long time ago? But you do come <laughs> back often, and you do give back to this community often. I love Louisville because it's my home. It's where I got my start. The riverfront still calls me. I love the beauty of the riverfront. But I come back to Louisville for three reasons, really. For Smoketown, for Prez, and the University of Louisville, and what I can do for all three. This is my home. This. My roots are here. My cousins are here. My grandmother's buried, you know, at the corner of Broadway and the curve. Um, this is home, and it always will be home. I've actually lived in Atlanta long, longer than I've lived in Louisville, but Louisville is home. <laughs> White Castles, Kingfish, <laughs> Prez, and U of L. And. You, you have made it a big point in your life to give back. How, oh, does, that, how yes. does that make you feel when you do that? Like what you did here for presentation. My mother always said, and everybody knows this saying, but it's true, to whom much is given, much is required. My mother always said, you have talents that are a gift. What are you supposed to do with gifts? You give them away. So I want to go to my grave empty. And even then I will be giving because I'm going to the Morehouse School of Medicine. You are? Yes, I am. Those are your final wishes. Those you're are not, my final wishes. You're not going to be buried in Louisville no. near your mother. No. Uh, my mother, actually, my grandmother's buried here. My mother's buried in, in Atlanta. Is she? But, and her, she went to the Morehouse School of Medicine. And I am going to the Morehouse School of Medicine. Uh, medical students need real people to work on. Organ donation. Body donation. Body, full body donation. Full body donation. I'm also an organ donor, but full body donation. What got you interested in that? That's fascinating. <laughs> the full body donation. The full body donation began, and it comes from Louisville again. When I was growing up, there was this story that U of L had a building, and I think the building's still there next to Jefferson College, mm -hmm. downtown, and that Sometimes people would disappear walking by, particularly if they were homeless. I know this is sick, but they would disappear and that, you know, the bodies were needed for research. So I remember as a child asking, well, why would they do that? And my mother said, because people don't donate their bodies. So, you know, you just don't go down there at night. So as I grew up, I learned about the body donation programs that came from my mother telling me, you know, they, people won't give, so they have to rob graves, they have to get people off the street. Now, whether or not that was true, I don't know. I never looked into it. But that has always been, ever since I've had a driver's license, and it's been possible that I've been an organ donor, and then most recently, um, when my mother signed up for body donation, I signed up for that too. The one thing I didn't ask you that yeah. we can start wrapping up with is standing out there, your mother looking down at you, oh. standing in front of those doors, what do you think she would be saying? Hattie right now would be in tears and, and the song she would be singing is The Lord Will Make a Way Somehow because that was her favorite song. She would look at those doors and look at me and say it was worth it.
My mom sacrificed a lot for me as a single parent. She never got alimony. She never went on welfare. She just worked herself to death, but she also gave. So when I got my first job, I said, no more pawn in this, this necklace. And it was my joy to buy her house. It was my joy to see her have the life she really deserved. So mama's smiling. Do you know that song? Oh. Can you sing it? Oh, you would ask me to do that when I haven't warmed up my voice. The Lord will make a way somehow. When beneath the cross I bow, he will take away your burdens. So let him, I can't remember the rest of it right now, but that's oh, basically it. That's beautiful. I can't believe I remembered that much of it and have not warmed up my voice. Oh, I, could hear, I could hear sister in this building going, A-E-I-O-U to warm up.